Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Megan Dorton, who is the Senior Associate Director of Admissions at Purdue University. Megan, how are you today? And thank you so much for being here. Hi, John. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I think I mentioned to you this is like a lifelong dream to be on a podcast. I'm a big <laughs> podcast fan, so I've been looking forward to this. So again, thanks for having me and more so thanks for thinking of Purdue for this. Well, it's our pleasure and I'm just as excited as you are. So Megan, let's get right to it. What could you tell us about Purdue University that makes it so appealing for so many students to not only want to apply, but ultimately attend? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I always say while most people know us for engineering, we have like 180 majors that are not engineering. So I think the breadth of opportunity at Purdue is one of the things that really draws folks to their interest in the university. Um, Certainly, you know, I think with with Purdue, there's a lot of just cool things happening across our campus. So, you know, our um, College of Liberal Arts just added a new music major. Purdue in the history of our university has never had a music major, but all these like really cool music opportunities, which is neat. We have an amazing College of Agriculture, which has great things going on. Kind of fun fact, the university was established as a land grant institution. So really our foundation is in the agriculture and mechanical sciences. So our College of Agriculture has cool things like food sciences with lots of research opportunities, a fermentation sciences major, (laughs) which is really fun. Um, They do, you know, um, really cool industrial processes like biofuels, which when people think of fermentation sciences, that's probably not the first thing that comes to mind. So really neat stuff there. Our Craner School of Management, which is our business school, it's a really um, pretty small and collaborative business school, which tends to be a little different than maybe what some folks might think of or see when they're looking at other business schools. They call themselves the Craner family. So that um, really uh, provides kind of a a cool bend on this really quantitative major in our business school. Uh, We have our own airport and a professional flight major. (laughs) So just some really, yeah, um, just some really neat and interesting majors. Um, The university is super innovative. I feel like every time I turn around, there's a a positive, typically, article about something cool happening at the university. We have an amazing data science major um, that that it's an actual program through our College of Science, but there's also a data mine learning community with 800 students who can participate, and it's across all majors. So really trying to create kind of these data uh, fluent students who are able to uh, really go into the world with these great data science skills that you need for all majors, liberal arts, agriculture, business, engineering, doesn't matter. Those are really important skills. So I think, you know, that that innovation, kind of the cool programs, you know, a lot of emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and math here. I think those are some of the things that really attract students to at least consider Purdue. Um, Then they get on our campus and they feel kind of that Midwest hospitality. People are, (laughs) you know, generally just pretty friendly. Um, The campus is beautiful. I'm probably a bit biased in that. Um, But, you know, then one student, you know, they know about us. And then once they get here, they're really able to kind of feel the the spirit, the camaraderie that our campus has to offer. So I I think, you know, those are some of the some of the reasons why some why folks might be considering us. Well, that's terrific. And I do know some students that have at this point graduated and nothing but great things to say about Purdue University. And I really appreciate you explaining all of those interdisciplinary opportunities. That sounds phenomenal. And I was not aware that you have 180 majors, which really sounds like you have something for everyone. And Megan, I also heard that there are a lot of new and exciting things happening at Purdue. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. So probably the most Well, I don't know. It was the most new and exciting thing until just last (laughs) week. Um, The most new and exciting thing probably is that after 10 years, our university is getting a new president. So in January of 2023, our former, well, 
current kind of former dean of our College <laughs> of Engineering, Meng Chang, he is actually going to become the president of the university. Wow. And then um, when Dean Meng Chang takes over, uh, our President Daniels, our current president, will step down at the end of this year. And President Daniels has been really known throughout the country. He, uh, you'll see him, you've probably seen him on national television, certainly in uh, publications. He does a lot of speaking, a lot of writing, um, just a super well-known, probably mostly for Purdue's Frozen Tuition, which we've had since 2012. That's kind of been the hallmark wow. of his time here. So uh, the transition to Dean Mung to becoming President Mung, I think will be um, a big change for the university, but it's big news. It was the biggest news out of Purdue until last week uh, when USC and UCLA were announced to join the Big Ten. So for the sports <laughs> fans who are listening, uh, they might put that at the top of the list at what's new at Purdue. So that'll be really interesting. One kind of cool thing that people don't typically know about the Big Big Ten um, is that we're more than just an athletic collaborative. There's an a academic collaborative as well. So folks from really all corners of our campus, um, academics, our home here in enrollment management and others, we collaborate really closely uh, with each other. And so having some new members of the Big Ten of uh, athletics, certainly that will add some interest, but I'm excited about what that could mean academically for our students as well. And so that's another really big new and exciting thing. Uh, we are starting in the spring of 23, going to be uh, completely renovating. Actually, the building I'm physically in right now, it will become a brand new data science building. So that's another new and exciting thing that will happen in the coming years is a, a whole building dedicated to data science. Um, just recently, there was a $75 million research and testing agreement with Rolls-Royce to fund testing and research uh, with a focus in the areas of gas turbine technology and electrical and digital technology. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. For sure. This actually came on the heels of a $73 million investment by the university for a new state of the art propulsion lab, uh, which will be part of our hypersonic testing capabilities on scale with large industry partners. Um, so lots of cool things going on in the world of uh aerospace innovation here at the university. We've kind of always been known for aerospace, the first and last person to walk on the moon are Purdue alums, but really kind of elevating the research and development that's happening in the space. There's an entire new district on our campus, the aerospace district, where these research facilities are popping up. So we're really excited about that. I mentioned the addition of the music major, uh, but we also are um, getting a brand new building for students who are in our uh, per bands and orchestras department. So that's something that's really been needed for those students. And I think it just speaks to the fact that Purdue really bands and orchestras, it's its essentially, you know, a, a club, an activity, something extra that our students can participate in. They can get some credit, but it's not a major. It wasn't really until just recently. And we're building, a, there's a whole new building really to support those students, which I think um, is just really, really cool. So a lot of, a lot of exciting things I could go on forever, but those, um, those are some of the, some of the highlights, I think. Well, those highlights are amazing. It sounds like there's so much innovation, so much new construction and opportunities as great as Purdue University is now. It just seems that the future is even brighter. So yeah. very exciting. Thank you so much for that comprehensive introduction, Megan. We really appreciate it. So Megan, how many applications do you actually review a year and do you represent a specific region? Yeah, so good question. Um, so on the whole, our office received, just for the incoming class of 2022, our office received about 70,000 total applications wow. for admission. Um, me personally, I probably read in the neighborhood of 5,000 applications wow. for admission. <laughs> um, a you know, maybe about two thirds of those were kind of a first read. And then the other third would be applications that I'm doing a, a second or final read, if you will, on. So not all of those were kind of, you know, the, the most intense review, um, but lots of applications. One thing that's kind of unique about Purdue is students apply to a major, were direct admit to major. So um, by design, we actually don't read applications specifically by geographic territory. 
to help with consistency, we read applications by academic college and then sometimes even a smaller subset. So as an example, our College of Science, we have a team who reads College of Science applications, but then a subset of folks who would read computer science because the, the differences in the applicant pool in the space available um, is it's, it's quite vast. And so uh, we, we do, we read by, by major and college rather than geographic territory, which again, just helps with the consistency. Now I will say that for our most competitive majors, we then have multiple other layers, right? And so at that point, we're really having to segment students um, or, or do tend to segment students by geography just to help get a, a kind of a cleaner comparison of the applicant pool. But for the most part, uh, we, we really just segment by academic college. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who is the founder and CEO of Prep Expert. He's a Shark Tank entrepreneur making a deal with Mark Cuban back in 2016. And he's also a board certified dermatologist who received a perfect score on his SAT. Sean, welcome back. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, John. So I just wanted to share with all your listeners real quick that we have an amazing partnership with the College Admissions Process Podcast, and we have a really special offer for all of your listeners. So for any listener who wants to enroll their student into one of our prep expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one-on-one -on -one tutoring programs, you can get 30% off just for being a listener of the College Admissions Process Podcast. All you need to do is put in the promo code College Talk, one word, just College Talk, and that'll give you 30% off all Prep Expert SAT courses, ACT courses, or one on one tutoring packages. Make sure you use the link in the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Thank you, Sean. We really appreciate it. To our listeners, as an affiliate partner with Prep Expert, I want to be transparent with you that for every purchase made using our coupon code, which is College Talk, the College Admissions Process Podcast will receive a small commission from Prep Expert. But rest assured that we only promote programs that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. So whether you're preparing for the SAT, ACT, or need a one on one tutor, Prep Expert has the tools and expertise to help you. For more information, please see the Prep Expert affiliate partnership link in the show notes. And now let's get back to the show. Well, we appreciate that explanation. Yeah. And that's also very unique that you don't do it by region, but you mm -hmm. do it by academic college or major. So thank you so much for that, Megan. Mm -hmm. What about the average profile of the current freshman class? Can you share in terms of GPA and any other data that you collect? What is the average profile? Sure. So we only have kind of clean data on the class of 2021. So this will be I will, I'll have new info in a couple months, but for the <laughs> class of 2021, uh, it was actually Purdue's largest incoming class. And if you follow Purdue News at all, you may have known that was a bit of a problem uh, around here because we obviously want to house all of those students and we need to have classroom spaces, et cetera. And um, the university community really just went into high gear when we enrolled that large class. It was 10,191 students who wow. came um, in August and the campus from, you know, after May 1st through August of last summer, the campus community just worked day and night to ensure that this large class that we were not anticipating had all of the resources and support and services that they needed new faculty new advisors those were all hired we you know found ways to house as many of those students as we could in what would be the most traditional housing available addition of you know whether it be lab space or um, we converted a, an old church on the edge of campus into a lecture hall which is one of the coolest things i think um, to just see that transform over the course of the summer so um, long answer to your question, 10,191 students in our largest ever class for the fall of 2021. Um, the academic profile of that, that class, the middle 50% GPA, and this is self-reported GPA from the students, a 3.5 to a 3.9. We don't, we don't have a, a scale beyond the 4.0. We'd use that 
just on the 4.0 scale. Middle 50% on the SAT is an 11.90 to a 14.10. And the middle 50% on the ACT, 26 to a 33. Uh, we're about 58% male, 42% female. Um, ratio. That's just something that I like to mention. It's it's always kind of known at Purdue. And so I don't want to, I don't like to bury it. I just like to <laughs> tell it how it is. So um, that's what the profile looks like. You know, I always do tell students because we admit to major for us, that profile of the middle 50%, that's across all majors that we have at the university. For our most competitive though, engineering, computer science, nursing, professional flight, the the average for those majors is really going to be the high end of those middle 50% ranges. So again, I think just in transparency, middle 50% is all the majors that we offer. But, you know, for majors where we have plenty of space for the qualified applicants, that's going to be a really true middle 50%. But for the programs where we simply don't have enough space for the qualified applicants, that that high end will be more of the average for those majors. Understood. And thank you so much, Megan, for making that distinction. And by the way, I will include the Office of Undergraduate Admissions in the show notes of the podcast. If there are any right. other links that you want to share with me so that I could put it in the show notes, just send it so that parents and students could have access to all of that. Thank you so much, Megan. Sure. What about the student's GPA as indicated on their transcript? Is that what you use or do you use your own metrics in terms of recalculating it? And if so, any insight that you could share would be greatly appreciated. Sure. You know, this is, I always say this is the million dollar question, <laughs> right? Uh, this question and questions about merit scholarships, uh, million dollar question. So uh, GPA is tricky. So for us, we do not use that number really for anything as part of our review process, uh, not from the transcript, for multiple reasons, one of which is that we actually allow students to self-report their high school courses and grades in the Common App. So for some students, we don't actually receive a high school transcript. Um, so they they kind of that GPA is essentially kind of calculated for them, if you will, when they're self-reporting that information. And that number, you know, within your high school setting, that number means a lot. But when we get applicants from literally around the world, that number just doesn't mean much to us. So what we're more focused on is the courses the student has taken, the grades the students earned in those courses, and then the courses that were available to the students. So essentially the context in which they took their coursework. We're, you know, in Indiana, lots of rural communities. Uh, some high schools may only have one or two advanced placement courses or dual enrollment courses. We also have communities where students have access to pretty much every course that they would want to take. So we really do um, appreciate the fact that we're able to take a more granular look at a student's ninth, 10th, and 11th grade coursework, grades earned, and then the courses available to them. So we can account for their learning environments. Understood. So it sounds like you look at the individual school profiles and based on what's available to them, you know, that's how you decide whether or not they're a viable candidate for Purdue University. Is that right, Megan? Exactly. Yep. So we'll we'll consider the offerings, the availability of courses within their high school and which of those courses did they choose to take. Understood. We appreciate that insight. What are the different ways that a student can apply to Purdue? And is there a benefit, Megan, to applying one way over the other? Yeah, so really we have just two ways for students to apply, both through the common application. One is early action. So as you know, and your listeners might know, but just for clarification, early action is not binding. So at Purdue, students apply by our early action deadline of November 1st. Um, and that really, I would say, does give a student a benefit in a bunch of ways, um, probably highest likelihood for admission, but also full consideration for merit-based scholarships. Our November 1st early action deadline is also the deadline to be considered for our honors college for students who have an interest in that. It's the priority application for majors like computer science, nursing, and professional flight. So the bulk of the students applying to Purdue really do apply by that early action deadline of November 1st. 
Uh, it also ensures that you'll get your decision as early as we release those. So for lots of students, they, they want to know that decision as early as possible. For us, that's a D January 15th decision release date on those early action applicants. We also do have a regular decision deadline. That deadline is January 15th. Students who apply by that deadline will be fully considered for admission with the exception of any of those majors that had a priority deadline. They may or may not be still fully considered at that point. And um, students will get their admission decision by the end of March, but no consideration for merit scholarships, no consideration for the Honors College. So we really, knowing the bulk of our applicants come in by that November 1st deadline, we really encourage students to apply by that date. Hi John, this is Gabby from Fordham University. The FYI Dorm of Five blog totally saved me during move-in. With all the dorm room do's and don'ts, how to get along with the roommate, and advice for getting involved on campus, Dormify helped me with so much more than just my dorm. I highly recommend college students to check out Dormify's blog because it answers so many of your college questions. Thanks for listening. Thank you Gabby for introducing Dormify to our listeners. Dormify is a one-stop shop for stylish and functional dorm decor, offering a wide range of stylish and functional products for anyone looking to decorate their dorms or small spaces. From bedding to wall decorations to storage solutions, Dormify has everything you need to transform your living space into a comfortable and stylish home away from home. Use our exclusive coupon code College Talk. that's one word, college talk to save 15 percent on most products when you shop at dormify.com or through the link provided in the show notes please note that if you make a purchase through the affiliate link or coupon code we provided the podcast will receive a small commission from dormify but rest assured we would only promote products that we truly believe in and think will benefit our listeners and now back to the show Understood. I appreciate that. And what are some of the things that students could do to demonstrate their interests? And do you track such things? Yeah, good question. Demonstrate interest is, is often a, a question we get. So I'll start by saying uh, pretty much every institution has a way of knowing whether or not a student has interacted with them, right? If they've opened their emails, if they've uh, attended events, et cetera technology is what technology is. So um, to tell you, if you call me and ask about an email, I can see exactly when you opened it. That is a possibility. However, for us at Purdue, uh, we do not use demonstrated interest in our review of applications. Um, but I think that there are lots of things that go along with demonstrated interest that can really help a student be a strong and possibly more qualified applicant. And what I mean by that is, you know, when students are trying to, if you will, check the box of demonstrated interest, that usually means they attend a campus visit, they come to a meeting when we're in their community, they meet with us at a college fair or when we're in their high school, they call us or email us with questions. So while those actions don't necessarily garner a, a check mark, if you will, for those students at Purdue, what I do find typically happens with those students who engage with us more in the process leading up to their application is that they just tend to be more informed candidates. They ask the right questions of us. So when they're applying, they get, if you will, tips on, you know, the things that they should be thinking about. So for example, just this morning, student emailed me with an interest in nursing and I was able to tell her, make sure in your senior year, you have a fourth year of science. That tends to be one of the biggest pitfalls that we see in applicants to our nursing program. They don't have, a, they don't finish strong in science. So I was able to tell that student, it's, it's not a secret and I'm happy to share that information, but it's probably not going to be something we put in our emails to students who show, tell us that they're interested in Purdue. Hey, by the way, if you're interested right. in nursing, make sure you right. take science. So, you know, I think that by being engaged in that process, students are able to just, again, be uh, more informed applicants when applying to the university. And the earlier they ask those questions, of course, the, the more helpful our, our answers probably are. <laughs> Absolutely. And I appreciate that. And it reminds me of not only engagement, but you want to engage in relevant questions. So the example you gave about someone specific to the nursing program and wanting to apply nursing, uh, and you being able to share with that person that, in fact, they should stay 
with the sciences for their four years of high school, I think that's great insight. And so it's a good piece of advice for students. If you're going to send an email, ask an email specific to the program that you're applying to, perhaps something that's not readily available on the website so that you could keep the conversation going and hopefully learn something more about applying to Purdue University. So we appreciate that. I know that Purdue University is test flexible. Can you share the percentage of students that applied without submitting their test scores? Yeah. So uh, Purdue is test flexible, but I feel like I always need to like add a little um, preface to that for Purdue's <laughs> test flexible policy. So now we are flexible in that we will still consider students for admission if they do not submit standardized test scores. We'll, in fact, also consider them for merit scholarships in our honors college. However, our preference, and we've been super transparent about this with students, is that we prefer they send us test scores. So as a result, about 70% of students who apply to Purdue apply with test scores. So 30%, I think your question was how many don't, uh, only about 30% do not submit test scores. Many students apply to Purdue with test scores. Um, I don't look for, for our preference for scores to change anytime soon. Uh, so for us, you know, we, we uh, value the test score if it's provided, but we do recognize there are still barriers to some students for, for getting that test score. So for students who don't have access to it or simply just choose not to send it to us, we will still consider them uh, for admission, merit scholarships in our honors college. Well, we appreciate that insight. Thank you so much. And that's part of the reasons why we have these conversations so that students and their parents who are considering applying to Purdue could get just that, you know, that information straight from someone like yourself who ultimately makes a decision. So thank you so much for that, Megan. I was also curious, does Purdue accept AP, IB, or dual enrollment classes for course credit? Absolutely. Uh, all of the above. Everything that you mentioned, we award credit for. Uh, we also award credit for not only higher level IB, but also some standard level as well, which is not super common uh, from institutions like us. So I think that's one thing that's a bit unique. I do always just like to mention when asked about dual enrollment or college credit, um, there's you know a few things that I think are really important for families to think about. I'm guessing some of your prior guests may have touched on this, but I always just feel compelled when asked about dual enrollment is if students are choosing to take dual enrollment in high school, I think it's really important that they think critically about why they're choosing to take dual enrollment. Is it for college preparation? So they just want to be sure they have that really strong foundation uh, when they're planning to apply to college. Or is it because they're looking to expedite time to degree? Um, because I, for some students, the answer to that question might dictate what they should be taking, whether they're taking dual enrollment or AP or IB, what dual enrollment courses they might be taking. Just as a, a real simple example, uh, oftentimes we see students with a lot of social science dual enrollment credit. And if you're applying to, let's say, our College of Engineering, you probably only need like three or six credit hours of social science. So if you come in with 12 credit hours, you likely will have six or nine credits that it's not at all going to help your time to degree. So even if all of that credit directly transfers to the university, it's not speeding up the time to graduate. It's not eliminating a semester or X number of classes from your plan of study in your four years at the university. So if you're a student who's thinking about using dual enrollment to expedite the time to degree, Unfortunately, the answer to that question for every institution is probably going to be a little different because every school will take that credit in probably a, a bit differently. And how then that credit will be applied to your major or the, the four-year plan of study, the list of courses you would take over four years, that's going to be you know, very different based on the institution. But I spend, I know our team spends a lot of time counseling students through courses that they can take in high school that would be applicable to their four-year degree plan at the university if they're offered admission. So we, we recognize that that's a, a very real and important reason students might take dual enrollment, but it takes a little extra work probably um, if, if expediting time to degree is the, the main driving force behind dual enrollment. 
Well, I really appreciate that insight, and I love how you put it. Being mindful of how to credit would apply to their major. That's something that hasn't come up in previous episodes, so I really appreciate that. And what has come up, in fact, is actually the first thing that you mentioned in terms of just the college prep, and I think a lot of students are taking it. Sure, I mean, it'd be, it would be great if they could get some credits, but I think it's also because they want to enhance their overall application. And so I think yeah. by taking more rigorous courses, it'll hopefully help them, you know, be admitted to schools like Purdue University, which of course is, is difficult to get into. It's competitive. Yeah. So, so we appreciate that, Megan. Thank you so much. And I get a lot of emails from parents and students with various questions. And recently I received some emails where they were asking about students that are being homeschooled. Megan, can you offer any insight in terms of how the application process differs for students that are in fact homeschooled? Yeah, I love this question because it is becoming more and more common. Uh, I will say before the pandemic, we had some students who were really choosing more or less traditional paths to um, kind of fulfill their high school graduation requirements. But since the pandemic, we see all sorts of ways that students are fulfilling high school requirements. So this is very, very common. So for us, the application process really is no different. Uh, students still apply in the same way. We have the same requirements, no extra requirements for homeschooled students. I do always tell oftentimes uh, families of students who are homeschooled feel compelled to submit pages and pages of, you know, the curriculum and, and the syllabus for the courses, etc. That's not really necessary unless the course really is something that isn't super intuitive. But for the most part, if you say you're taking a biology class and you have a grade for that biology class, I don't really need any extra context, just like I don't need any extra context uh, from a high school uh, that, that a student is maybe taking that course from. So I always just remind families who are doing homeschooling that we don't need those ec that extra information unless there's just something that's really important for us to know. Um, the biggest thing that I would tell families of students who are being homeschooled is that um, making sure that you're keeping track of what Purdue calls our subject matter expectations. So there's essentially kind of a baseline set of course requirements that we really expect all students to have completed by the end of their senior year of high school. And as long as students are on track to meet those minimum expectations, all is good. Um, but oftentimes, especially if students are maybe uh, choosing a variety of different uh, modes of uh, learning, so if they're learning some online, maybe they're doing some in dual enrollment, maybe they're, you know, doing some other form of education, when you're putting all that together, just making sure that those subject matter expectations are being met and nothing's being missed. But absolutely no um, no differences in the process at all. And, you know, we see students being admitted who are being homeschooled at, I would hedge a bet, the same the same rate as every other every other student. So no no real concerns from us at all. Well we appreciate that. Thank you so much because I actually got multiple emails on the same topic. So that's great that you're able to share some insight. And I always advise parents and students, by the way, that if they have specific questions, it's always best to reach out to the Office of Admissions. You're so accessible and ready, willing, and able to help. So if anyone has any follow-up questions, just please reach out to the admissions office always. Yes, Me always, always. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, how important are students' courses in progress and grades in their senior year? And what are you looking for when reviewing them? Yeah, so this is so important, actually, um, especially in the most competitive majors here at Purdue, part of that evaluation of the application includes the strength of curriculum related to the courses available. So if we see that a student is really challenging themselves into and through that senior year, uh, that will be a really important factor in our process. I just mentioned, I mentioned the nursing student just a bit ago. Um, and I, I will say, frankly, students who let off the gas in that senior year, that, that would be a differentiator, um, not a positive one for a student applying to those most competitive majors, right? Like most of the students are, you know, they've exhausted, for example, their math curriculum in their high school or their science curriculum in their high school. And so now they're seeking out some other ways to learn 
this material, they're going to the local community college, et cetera. So for a student who who backs off of that, um, that that could be detrimental to the student. So we really encourage students to continue with core academic courses in that senior year so that they're really ready to uh, jump in with both feet when they get to campus in August. Very good. So students, remember, keep putting your best foot forward, not only in your freshman, sophomore, <laughs> and junior years, but throughout senior year. Let's not get into the senioritis conversation. Don't right, get Maggie? into the senioritis or you'll end up with a nasty gram from us. I always say, like, I hate sending those nasty grams. We're like, what were you doing? Make sure you seek out resources when you come to Purdue so this doesn't happen. <laughs> well, thank you again, Megan. And of yeah. course, another part of the overall application is the college essay. So what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? And what advice would you share with prospective students in terms of how to approach their essay when they're sitting down and they're going to start writing it? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, so <laughs> my favorite college essay is probably, it's, it's probably been 10 years now since the student wrote the essay, but it was so impactful to me. So um, the essay was from a student who was applying to our exploratory studies program. So this is for our general undecided students, good at a lot of things, can't really narrow it down. Maybe they have two or 20 career interests. Um, just that student who doesn't know exactly what they want to study at a place where we ask you to pick a major if you want one <laughs> when you apply, right? So um, love the exploratory studies and the student had applied to exploratory studies and her whole essay was about why she chose exploratory studies. And she talked about the fact that she would get up every Saturday morning with her dad. They would go to a local coffee shop and her dad's job, it's, I think on the side, was to buy and flip houses. And she would help her dad look through uh, the local newspaper, think about houses that might be good investments. And she just loved this time with her dad. She loved the work of buying the investment properties and flipping the houses. And I just, I could picture this whole Saturday morning coffee shop routine, and it helped me really get a, get a clear understanding of why this student wanted exploratory studies. Did She didn't, you know, there's not a major in real estate flipping. Well, I guess there might be, but there's not at Purdue. She, <laughs> you know, she, she didn't know how to get to kind of that, that ultimate career goal by way of a particular major. So she was going to use exploratory studies to help her really find the major that would help her on that path to what her ultimate career goal was. So I love, loved that essay. I'm, I get this question all the time and I pretty much always answer it with the student story. Um, so that's an essay that really stuck with me. And I'll say it is, the essay is one of the best ways that we get to know you. Uh, I've worked at small private institutions where I meet a student at a college fair, I read their application for admission, I meet them at an open house event, I you know, help move them into the residence hall if they choose to come. Um, but at a place the size of Purdue, we don't really, unfortunately, get to know students at that personal level very often. And that essay really is how we get to know students. And I also think it's just a great way for students to really help uh, paint that clear picture of who they are. Right. And so as they're they're thinking about all the pieces that they want to be sure we know about them and that eight to 12 minutes that it's pro that we're probably going to spend reading their application. It's the, the essay is one of the ways that students can kind of finish that painting. They can make sure that, you know, the grass is green and make sure that we really see um, who they are as as people, as individuals. And that, that story is probably, it's super unassuming, right? Like that student didn't cure cancer, um, nothing out of the ordinary. But that essay has really stuck with me. And that's the sort of thing that we're really looking for in, in the essay. It's something that is unique to the student, um, but it doesn't have to be earth shattering to be a really compelling essay. Well, thank you so much for that insight. And it goes to show that the essay does not have to be that elaborate. Something simple, like the example that you shared, fills the need, which is in the essay, that's where you get to know the student as a person, how they think, perhaps you get some insight in terms of their character, not something that's easily found elsewhere, where you're looking at a, an activity sheet or the transcript. So thank you so much for sharing that example, and I hope that the students and parents are taking notes on it. Absolutely. Another, 
I feel like the essay keeps students up at night. So <laughs> hopefully that will help them take a take a breath uh, and maybe feel more confident to tackle that essay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. And yes, they do stay up at night for it because they stress. They think it has to be something really sad or really devastating. But in fact, you know, the example that you gave is perfect because it's simple. It's just, you know, conversations with her father at a coffee shop. But it gave a lot of insight in terms of who she is. And that's Mm -hmm. ultimately what the goal of the essay is. So thank you, Megan. And of course, the teacher letters of recommendation are obviously another part of the application. So what are you looking for in terms of helping to enhance an application from the teacher's letters? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Purdue doesn't require letters of recommendation, but we get a lot and we're happy to read those. I'll tell you, um, as working for an institution for a long time that doesn't require uh, letters of recommendation, I always feel like I have a lot of opinions about them. Um, The best letters of recommendation to me tell me things that I can't glean from other pieces of the application. So just a regurgitation of what's on that activity sheet isn't super helpful to me. Uh, So I always encourage students to think about the teachers, and maybe it's not always a teacher. It might be a coach or the person who oversees a club or an organization that they're involved in. Um, Those people can often tell us things about, you mentioned character just a minute ago, I think character is a big thing we can often find in the letters of recommendation that we we don't get otherwise. Uh, one of another thing is often things like leadership. We can tell that from a letter of recommendation based on who writes that. Um, work ethic. I was a, a we have a lot of athletes here in our office and I always use the example of like can is your coach going to write a letter of recommendation and be able to tell me that as a senior you were constantly mentoring the freshmen on the team. You were the first one in the gym and the last one to leave. And you might not have got any playing time, but you made sure that all the balls were shagged at the end of practice, et cetera. Those are things for us that tell us a ton about a student that we can really not at all see in any other pieces of the application. So I I challenge students to think about who can write those sorts of things about them. And sometimes maybe it's the teacher where they got the grade they're not so excited about, (laughs) but that teacher can say, oh, you know, this student, they came to class prepared every day. They, you know, worked really hard. Every time they missed problems on an exam, they came back in and they made sure they understood it, that material, so they knew it for the final. Those are the sorts of things that, again, that's going to tell me a lot more than that C on the student's transcript, for example. Well, that's great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. And students, if there's a teacher where something special did happen, maybe it was on a trip, maybe it was in class, don't be shy to ask the teacher if he or she would be interested or willing to write about that specific example, right? Like what Megan said, they want to read something that's not elsewhere in your application. So if you're the first person to practice, you know, you mentioned the coach, if you're the first one to practice, the last one to leave, uh, maybe that's something that the coach could include in a letter, which again, gives people like Megan and admissions more insight in terms of who you are as a candidate. So I appreciate that. And of course, Megan, a student's activity sheet is another piece of their application. What are some of the things you are looking for beyond the work they did in the classroom? Yeah, uh, really anything. (laughs) We just want to see that students have done some things beyond the classroom. There's no um, magic combination, right? And I think there are some pieces of the application where it's best if the students really just handle that and not the parents. But sometimes the activity section, the students need a little help remembering the great things that they are doing or have done. I met a student last fall where I was I was asking him the things he does outside of the classroom and like he couldn't come up with a single thing. And his mom <laughs> was like, well, you were a camp counselor for the last three years and you're going to be like in charge of this thing for your youth group. And I'm like, wait, Your mom just told me two really amazing things. The student couldn't come up with a single one. (laughs) So uh, parents are super about bragging about their kids. So maybe having a parent kind of help jumpstart that activities listing. What are the things that I've done? Um, But the activities listing really, you know, can include all the things, uh, family responsibilities, work that the student is involved in. 
Uh, you know, some students have the opportunity to do really cool things like job shadow. So all of that can be included. I think um, in demonstrating any kind of leadership and leadership can take a bunch of forms, right? Like there's one president for every club. So we know we're not going to have a bunch of presidents applying to the university. But how else do you show leadership? Is it through mentorship? Um, so you know, all of that is really important when we're reviewing. So there's, again, no magic combination, but we want students to really be thoughtful about what they're including and include some of those things that, again, show us a little more uh, to that student. So um, we'll, you know, we'll get the, the four years of soccer and the, you know, eight years of Boy Scouts, the 10 years of 4-H, et cetera. Um, but it's, you know, those those other pieces, too, that are so important is um, I always remind students not to forget the stuff they do beyond the walls of their high school. Well, those are great pieces of advice, and I really appreciate this conversation, which leads us to our last question, Megan. In closing, what are the top three pieces of advice you would give a student and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I'm going to start with probably what I think might be the most shocking or awkward for parents, and that is to start talking about money early. Um, Purdue is a public institution in the state of Indiana, and I can't tell you the amount of times that I speak with students in April. They've They've fallen in love with Purdue. They dream of Purdue. They get their financial aid award package, and they simply can't afford it. They simply can't afford it. And it's the first time that they've had a realization that that the cost is too much for them or for their family. So I think one of the, the kindest, but probably hardest as a parent myself, I, I know this will be a hard conversation, is to have a conversation with the student early in the search process so that they can just have the right frame of mind as they're building the list of colleges and universities they want to consider, being transparent about what the family is able to help pay to support the, the student in college, what the expectations are for the student. And that's just such a personal conversation. And the, the fact that college will be, you know, fully funded through merit scholarships when your student's really super bright at public institutions, that's that's not reality for the most part. And so I think that having the conversation about money early in the process is really important. That's become one of my top points for parents uh, as I get this question. Another one is to be open-minded in this process. Um, and I, I probably work for one of these schools, so I don't feel bad saying this, but bumper sticker schools are not the only schools. Um, there are so many colleges and universities and the news takes up, you know, they, they talk about like 20 of us. And so I think that, you know, thinking beyond the bumper stickers, thinking about the colleges and universities that will be a good fit for the student. Where will they thrive? Uh, where will they have the ability to get involved in ways that are important to them? Uh, you know, is that through leadership? Is that through research? What is it that's most important to the student? And where will they be able to build the relationships that are really important to them? So I really love it when a student has colleges and universities on their list that um, are not the same as every other student applying to college from their high school. It's really um, encouraging students to explore colleges that maybe they've never heard of before and college fairs and the, the college reps that come to high schools all fall long to talk with students about their institution. Like, that is a great way to learn about places that you've maybe never heard of before. So um, I really encourage students to just be super open-minded when thinking about colleges and universities because there are just some amazing institutions that do not get enough airtime. And then as a result, um, all the students apply to the same schools. <laughs> so um, I really encourage students to be open-minded. And then the last thing, and you actually, I think, talked about this at the very beginning is Use us, college admission counselors. Our literal job is to help students and families <laughs> through this process. Like it, It's actually our job, uh, which is sometimes hard to believe that we 
do this for a living. But, um, you know, it's, it's our top priority, at least in, in our office. And I would hedge a bet this is true in most admission offices, the front facing aspect of our work. So answering our phones, responding to emails, meeting with students and families that come to our campus for visits. It's a top priority. It's absolutely always the top priority. And if we don't do those things, the rest of it falls apart. And so contact us. Uh, we're happy to help guide you through the process. Sometimes we're not going to give you the exact answer that you're looking for. <laughs> we might talk you through our thought process, um, but you know we won't always be able to say do this exact thing or do that exact thing to get the outcome you want. Um, but we're really happy to guide you and and if you know i always tell students and families like i don't want you spinning on a question for days trying to find the answer or to figure it out like just call us and you'll probably get an answer in like five minutes <laughs> so that's that's literally what we're here for um so use the admission office so start talking about money early look beyond the bumper sticker schools and then use the college admission reps um that's we're really happy to help well, those are great pieces of advice. Megan, I cannot thank you enough. I'm so happy because I know that this conversation is going to help so many students and their parents. We really appreciate your time and your insight today. Thank you so much for being with us, Megan. And yeah. I hope to have you again soon, by the way. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me. This was a blast. It's going to go on my, on my top list of career highlights, I think. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you again, Megan. You were awesome. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.